Hi, my name is Bennett, and welcome to part two of my looking at uh, drums series. Um, primarily, I'm starting by looking at the individual drum sounds, the main ones. Last video was about kicks, so I've walked through what are the elements of a kick drum, how can we make those from scratch, or if you are playing with samples, uh, what to look for in the samples that you are working with, uh, or if you've got a sample that you like most of it, but you feel like it needs a little something else, if you understand what all the elements of those sounds are, then you can add those in. And that gives you a huge amount of control. So rather than saying, look, I kind of like the sound, but it's not right, I've got to audition 2,000 more samples, you can either say, I'm going to build my sound from scratch, which of course is what I love to do, and I, and I, and I think it is a mark of a true craftsman. Or you can say, look, I'm, this sample is doing its job nicely, uh, but if I can just add that element, whether that's enhancing the, uh, the, the basic tone, which is your drum head, or the, um, the box that your sound is in, uh, or, or um, your beta sound, what is that part that you're missing? If you can identify it, then it's much easier to either find a sample that's strong in that and focus those parts into the mix with your next sound, with your first sound, or, as I say, to just build from scratch. But it's about adding. When you've got pre-made sounds and you're trying to take away, it doesn't work as well as I showed you. So, snare sounds. Here's our kick. I've taken all the processing off. Leave me free to process as we do snares. So the difference between a kick drum and a snare is primarily two things. If we're, we're talking about a real rock and roll kit, a rock kit, your kick drum is traditionally fairly large. So through its size, it allows it to be a deeper tone. Sometimes they're open-ended on the back. Sometimes they're closed-ended. They're going to be tonal differences, uh, and obviously it's going to change how you mic it up and what have you. But mostly here we're going to be working with sounds that we make. So size, you could say that, okay, uh, we could make a snare by taking a kick drum and just lifting everything in pitch, and in theory we would have a snare. And in an electronic sense, yes, it will work. And there are some situations, especially in techno, where it's very, very big and loud, where the snares really sound more like kick drums. Um, so that's one way to see it. But the other element of a real physical kit on the snare is that you've got a shallower tub and you've got underneath a set of springs. They're the things that give you that unique rattly snary thing. So it depends how you tune those. Now if you're chasing an acoustic or a realistic type sound, you really want to be thinking about those snares, because those snares are a lot of what define the sound. If not, if you're working purely with your own made up sound, then you've got obviously a lot more freedom. So if you think of very, very early drum kits, drum machine sounds, you commonly had snares that sounded like this. Now they were uh, a pretty interesting lot. If you don't want to believe me, track down Trio, da da da, don't love you, you don't love me. That's a, a, um, a little Casio machine, and basically square wave sounds for the, the, the kick and snare. They've got other sounds in there as well, but that's a distinctive sound in that mix. So, we've got a head. Generally, we don't want it down there because that's in kick territory. We generally don't want it up here because it's just creepy. Even a piccolo snare is going to be not going to be up there. You can make a snare that sounds great on its own, but it needs to be in reference to what's going on over here. So that's where we really get into tuning. 
a kit wants to be tuned with itself. Now, you could get into saying, okay, I'm going to make this kit be literally in tune. So if I'm in C major, then my kick will be at its tone on C, and either C or G, which is your, um, your seventh or your fifth. That will sit very nicely. An octave above, obviously, will sit nicely. Um, you could even use your, your fourth, which is your E. So C, E, C, F, C, G, or C with C one octave above, if you need to tune literally. I'm not a massive fan of doing that all the time. There are times in which it will work. But one of the problems with that is that you can end up having drums that are so in tune with everything else but they don't really have spark because within the mix they're too homogenous. You don't want them to be horrifically out of tune with each other. Doesn't sound right. Sounds a lot better. So that, what we're hearing there, think of that as being just the physical body of the drum. We would then want to add in snares. Actually, if we're thinking snares, we'll go to Reason has this device called a rattler, which is you trigger a sound and then this device rattles a little like it's a snare. And it does a surprisingly good job. There's a fair amount of variability in this thing. I won't say that it's a device that I use that much. I haven't fully grokked how to make sense of it, but if I'm after a more acoustic sound, I'm far more likely to, to, to grab for one of the physical models. And then if I really want to add in some of the snariness from there, but I'd rather use one of these, even though they're a slightly funny sounding device, than, um, than one of these rattlers. They, they just... I don't love it. The concept is great. The execution... I don't love. But honestly, I'm the same with the, um, the synth snares that are in here. There are some things about it that are great, some things I don't really love, like a lack of control. So. You find what you love. Um, I really like using the separate tones and noise sources. See, we've got a very workable snare sound right there. We could say, yeah, good enough, we'll go home now. But it's going to depend on what you're mixing. As I said, I've heard a lot of techno things where they're running more of that sort of thing. They're really, really, really light on the snare. There's, there's virtually nothing there because. You've got the kick and the snare happening at the same time. So really all they're doing is almost like making a second kick. So you've got one kick that's very... Just your, your lows. One of those. And one which is... And they can be mixed very low. Because the mix is so busy 
and you've got those massive super sore things and what have you on top, having full, fully fledged snare sound is is not necessary. It's overkill, and it actually detracts from the kick drum. So you don't necessarily have to have big fancy snares. You can have quite simplistic things. So it then comes down to how do you want to balance your sound out? If you want to see more snary, more snappy, you'll tend to take away the body, the shell of the, uh, of the snare and then possibly make it brighter. They're getting up into 808 territory there. Concern with that kind of snare, where you're getting this bright, <coughs> is that you then got troubles with your hi-hats. Your snare and your hi-hats are living in the same territory. <coughs> Excuse me. You can deal with that to some extent through then making sure that your hi-hat sounds live lower. So your hi-hats may be pitched about here with your snare up here. And that allows you to have a, a, a super snappy snare, like really bright, really snappy. But if you want a snare that feels like it sits inside the mix more, it's got that really smack feel to it. And that's, that's great. That's going to sit very, very nicely. Then comes to timings. If we make, let's just pull that out for a moment. We might say, okay, that's our body. Let's give it a few overtones. Snares tend to have more overtones in the um, because it's a it's a smaller box, it's a smaller skin. So you tend to have more overtones in the sound than your kick. There are a few ways of doing it. One is if you've got the ability to add overtones with your device here, or the other is to take control of them, which we'll look at in a mo. We might say, okay, that's that's my tub. That's the heart of my tub. You can look into bends, but if you're not careful, it can just sound a bit, a bit kind of wrong. So. See how you go, it's always to taste, but don't, well my advice is don't build your snare purely just by looking at the body, because it's really the noise that defines this. The, the, the skin and body define your kick drum, but the noise is what defines your snare drum, as a general rule of thumb. So if we bring this back in, we can have... This happened at the same time, so you see your attack is very fast on the physical part of the snare, the noise part very fast as well. Really synthetic sound. If that's what you're after, great. It pushes that noise right up to the front. Notice I've got the click off here. And, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel very authentic or characterful. Whereas, so now you've got the stick hitting the body and a little while for that noise to develop, which is your snares, which are the springs underneath that rattle. So it takes a little while for them to be excited and get into motion. So we're, we're emulating that here. So we bring this back a lot more. We've got the exciter.
and the snary part. The two parts are actually concurrent, as in you hear the excite and then you hear the rattle. And by doing that, you actually develop a really cool sound. And you can build a lot of character from not only the balance of those, the tone, nice dark snare, silver. How short your sand is. Getting into overkill territory, but that's cool. I like that. Especially if you combined two snares. So your first hit, you could have a short snare. Let's try and emulate this very quickly. Quite a long snare. Very, very common technique uh, in a lot of 80s tracks. And I'm not saying you want to emulate the 80s. Whether you do or you don't, it was still a very effective thing because rather than your snare seeming to be same every single time, I've got a Duran Duran uh, concert um, to part of the arena um, re-release and there are a couple of tracks at the end there that they've added on where particularly the, the snare and the tom rolls they're a sample and they just cut off they're just machine gun <laughs> um, so to help overcome that they used to use two, two different sounds so that same but different you didn't necessarily notice it but it added this extra layer of excitement to the track. Um, that's just making that snare body brighter. But we've also got, in this case, Resonance. So what we're doing is basically using ways to filter our sound of our noise. You could do this with an EQ or anything like that, but this is built in to try and make it, you know, one knob to rule them all and does a really nice job once you understand what it's doing. in the middle there we've got hand claps click as remember is nothing but a, um, a click just a little black sound on the front so the resonance we can change our sound. We can also set this to sweep. So basically what it's doing is going pew, pew, pew with each hit. Um, I've never been a massive fan of my snares doing that. So I tend to leave the sound flat. But there are times where it can be kind of cool. So we've got real character definition in the tone there. It also allows you, in this instance, to narrow down to narrow down the the bandwidth of noise that you're hearing. 
if you're working with a device with more controls than this, you can really go to town with high pass, low pass, band pass filters, all kinds of things like that. But for a single device, th this provides you a lot of flexibility. Now, the next thing that we can do is what we did with kick drum. Let's get rid of any overtones here and here. We can create an overtone. Now, if we're going to create an overtone, remember that's probably going to develop a little bit later. You hit something, the main tone comes out, and the overtones develop. Generally, in, remember in a drum, your main tone is the head of the drum, the bit you're whacking. You can get overtones through the tin that it's in. Now, depending on whether that's uh, a wooden shell or a metal shell, because it's not uncommon to have metal shells on the snares, give them that, that brighter tone. Uh, you can also have wooden shells as well. You also get a lot of um, fancy modern materials, which are commonly designed for a kind of deadness. But you can handle overtones however you want to do it. You can set them up so the overtone is really short. Let's just give ourselves some noise. Back here, so we can add an overtone. Now, this I think you can get quite excitable with. Synthy, not quite so synthy anymore. And if you push your overtone quite a lot, hear how this is now starting to sound a bit like a box. Because literally, that's what a snare is still. It's still a box. It's a funny round box with a bit of dead pig on top and some bits of shrapnel underneath, but it's still a box. So it's starting to get quite a nice boxy sound there. I know a lot of people will then go, oh, that boxy sound is no good, we need to EQ it out. But ask yourself what kind of sound you're looking for. If you were mixing a, a jazz act using wooden drums, uh, especially if they've, they've got really nice skins and everything on them, like skin skins, they're going to have that boxy feel because that's the real sound of that kit. So if you then go saying, oh, I'm going to EQ that all out because I like house music, it's like you're not honouring the material that you're doing. I see a lot of people ask for music to be made and they share well, I saw one the other day on, on Upwork where, where the guy was going, oh, I, I want you to make something that sounds like Fly Me to the Moon. Fly me to the moon. I mean, that's that's a jazz standard now. And, and it brings a real feel with it. There's a whole lot of emotional collateral that goes with it. But the problem was they then said, oh, but we want it to sound really modern. So the problem there was that they were saying, yeah, we want to take that cliche, but we actually want to gut it. Because there's no way you can realistically, realistically make something that actually has the feel of Sinatra from that time and put storming 909s on top of it. There's a fair amount of one or the other. Now, I know many of you are going, look, Benedict, look, Benedict, look, Benedict, and you're going to want to send me stuff. Yeah, the Spice Girls did a rather cool track where they were aping a lot of those things. Does it really sound like that era? No. 
Was it cool? Yes, it was cool. It was a lot of fun. So just be careful. If you're working with something and you're very used to a different sound, you may be creating a new genre sound. You may be creating a fusion, or you may actually be gutting the very thing that you're trying to build. So if you've brought in, say, a jazz drummer to add jazz feel to your uh, otherwise techno track, or death metal track, or whatever, you've got to really honour what makes that feature what it is. So if you take in your jazz drummer and you then go straight away to your mixing desk and you EQ his drums, let's say his snare drum, because we're talking snares here, if you EQ all the boxiness out of it, and go really bad frequencies and make it sound boxy, you're going to end up going, hmm, I did this thing, and of course I'm super clever because I mashed these things up. Yeah. But in the end, you're not going to achieve the sound or the feel that you were looking for because you stripped out the things that make it unique. So let's go back to our overtone. No overtone, very electronic. A little bit of overtone, nice and boxy. You can do weird things though, which don't happen in nature. My overtone is now rapidly turning into an undertone. A lot of snares can have two heads, one up here, one down there. And by changing the tuning on those heads, this one starts bright, bright, goes dark. So you can um, do quite a lot there. And if you've got good control, that's one of the things I don't like about the, uh, the inbuilt synth snare here, is that you, while you've got harmonic decays, you can't really choose how they decay separately from each other. You can in one way, but not the other. Whereas here, you've got decay controls on each part, so you can build them up separately. How's that for cool? Bit overdone. that sound with this, I think our tuning is a little wrong. Bit of will though, you can make anything you want. So again, just like with the kick, you can add in several elements. You've got your main tone, which is set by the skin that you whack. You've got a second tone, which can come from the shell, or in this case, a second skin, you can tune them differently, or both at once. And then in snares, the real distinctive things, once you get past the, the, the character of the, the skin and shell, is the snares themselves, the bits of metal that are rattling around inside. And that's where you can control this. And here how different our snare is. based on the combination of the tuning of the sound and the timing of the sound. So it's all in little tiny details. So with just the attack, decay, and pitch of the noise there, before we even get into EQing that noise, we've got 50 or 100 samples straight up there. That we just move the knob a tiny bit, sample it off, call it a different sound. Right, cool. Then we get into the whole processing thing. What are we going to do to process our sounds? Again, I'm sending this through the bus effect first. But what might we want to do to our sound? Let's look at the, the drive and resonate first. 
depending on how you want your snare to sound in the mix, remember it's always the mix, a bit of overdrive can really be a cool thing. Obviously the more you drive it, the more it gets, and you may need to look at reducing the overall decay of your sound. Resonance is great on snares. So remember, snares are designed to resonate more than any other drum, with the possible exception of your side tom. They're really about resonance. So. Yeah, that's changed the sound dramatically. Nice aggressive rock kind of sound. A hidden rock sound. But we've got a and so it's just a case of changing the resonance, the size. that we could even go in and get rid of our overtone. Hear that lovely resonant whine that we've got developing in, in that snare. So suddenly it's like we're hearing a body. that. So don't be at all afraid to use resonators on the snares. They will give them a tremendous character. Just be cautious that you don't overdo it. That sounds great. If we start pushing it harder, oh, both kick and snare are going through that, which I like, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about a lot later. But um, by putting the pair through together, they, they match a lot better, which I'll talk about later. Nonetheless. So the thing that makes this exciting more than anything else is that resonance. Real character snare. I don't want to use that all the time, but boy is that cool. So that's one thing we can be doing to our sound. Parametric EQs, of course, we can take some or all. There's absolutely no reason why without this. General rule of thumb is you're not going to want to be increasing or adding a lot of bass when it's down in here. Yeah, that doesn't sound so well. But you can do it. Just be cautious, though, that if you're triggering the two of them together, you're building this great big lump, which is going to cause you some problems in your mix. So the general rule of thumb is you're going to want to EQ this. Let's just pull this back to the master. Sorry, just... 
So now only our snare is being affected by this. All is going to depend on what that performance is like as to how you're going to EQ it. You can also get very tight. Here, how we're adding a tone now. If you really want to, you can run through and get rid of a tone. But as I said before, why would you getting, be getting rid of a tone when that's what you recorded? Just be aware that a little bit of tone, a little bit of a resonance tone, which is what you're doing here, pulling out a resonator, is good, but too much. It's far too much. There's very little character that you're going to make out of that. Once in a while you might find use for that, but generally you don't want it. You might, however, if you don't want your sound, snare to sound the same all the time, you might, however, automate that, which we can look at in another situation. So if that frequency keeps moving around on that snare, it's going to sound the same, but at the same time there's going to be this little element that's different every time it hits, and people are going to go, wow, that's a cool snare. It's going to help that really cut through the mix. So never be afraid to do things like that. The danger is that when you're doing it, you're going to tend to want to push it till you can really hear it. Look how clever I am. Look how, look at everyone. Listen to how clever I'm being here. Not your, not your role. Your role is to make the snare cut through the mix. Not necessarily to say, look how clever I'm being because I'm automating these knobs. So a little bit will commonly go a long, long way there just to pick some frequencies move them around a little bit so that each snare hit seems a little different because drummers don't hit in the same place every time they're like kind of you know all over the drum and that helps emulate some of that feel I mean, by rights if you wanted to there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't get into automating quite a few of the parameters the pitches and what have you just be very subtle because otherwise every drum hit's going to sound <laughs> And it's going to be really hard to relate them together. So subtle is the key there. So parametric EQ. Um, find something in that snare that sounds great and bring it out. It's about emphasizing something. Again, just be cautious because we want this to match the rest of our kit and of course the rest of our piece of music. Remember my policy on drums is that you don't really want to be working too hard on drums until you have the rest of the piece there. Make your drums on their own, they sound stunning, brilliant, you've used every single piece of bandwidth you've got there and then suddenly you're going to try and jam something else in which means that you've either got to turn your drums down in which case you start to feel deflated uh, or you're just going to try and pile more and more stuff on until you overmixed. So we can look at EQing things. Let's leave that it's kind of nice where it is. Compressing. We're all going to jump into compressing, which we'll come back to later. Rather, we've already done. Ring modulating is great on snares. Absolutely great on snares. Again, we just adding another overtone. If you've got lots of tones already, you may not need it, but here you're adding a little bit of character in there. All depends on how you're uh, device operates. Actually, I don't think that one automates from here, which is kind of a shame. But if you set an envelope to these, you can have that move. It's kind of cool. Ring modulators, don't overdo them. Reverbs on snares. 
big issue. Your kick, you commonly want to keep down the, the middle. Your snare, you often want to be quite big. See how the kick loses presence there? We'll take this off here, off there too. We'll put the uh, verb here. Just leave that bypass for the moment. You can put quite a lot of reverb on the snare. Bear in mind your reverb tends to pull that snare back into the mix, but that can be a good thing. It gives it a sense of size as well. So you can have forward kick, snare that's a bit back, but that reverb can make it work really, really well. The thing that helps you manage that, the fact that it's pulled back, is your kick is essentially mono. The snare is pulled back in the mix because it's covered in reverb, but if it's fairly wide stereo, not enough to mess with the rest of the mix though, it makes it seem larger than life. So its largeness in, in comparison is really, really good. Just be cautious though. That's probably a better balance because you, chances are you're going to have other things to wrap around it. If you've got big synth pads or something like that, you're probably wanting them to wrap around. And if the snare's out here as well, you can get into trouble. So better to kick snare pads or whatever else is out there, orchestra. So many things that you can do with reverb. It's all going to depend on what you want to do there. Echo's generally something that you're going to either want to keep really subtle or to feature. It's a real dub kind of a thing to do. So that just entirely depends on what you want to do. We can have a snap, a slap back. Hear how that comes in. So we can use it. Like it's a kind of reverb. Focus it a bit up there. A little bit longer. It does add a whine, so you gotta be careful how you do it, but that's actually a kind of a cool trick. used a lot in the 80s. Will sound horrible or excellent, not a lot of in between. But it is a it is a good technique to know about because if you're looking to do something a bit different, reaching for a very short echo can be very effective. Or if you're feeling very bad, how spell the goes is dead, that sort of thing. Um, other act that did a lot of that, uh, Play Dead, from around the era. There, there, there was a lot of, especially a lot of their remixes were very, very echo heavy. And it's a sound that's got so much character to it. You don't want to overdo it, you don't want to do it without purpose. But if you can do it with purpose and leave the space around it, remember a lot of those mixes were relatively open. So they weren't jamming in you know, massive walls of sound. They had a characterful singer, a good singer, a singer with charisma, often a poor voice, but good charisma. Uh, I mean, Peter Murphy out of, out of Bauhaus is a tremendously charismatic singer. And so it 
can work beautifully. You add this huge atmosphere. So don't be afraid of echoes, but make sure that they work nicely. Transient designers are a weird thing. They're kind of like a compressor, but kind of not. So go carefully with them. You can make your attack kind of mushy and slow, or you can make it even harder. It's very easy to overdo it with these. I think these are better used on samples where you've got no real control of what's happening in the guts of them. If I wanted to make those kinds of changes in here, I'd probably be making the changes in here with my attack and decay more than this. But sometimes you can get a sound out of them. Like that's kind of cool. We've snappied that up, especially if we were to be adding Nice ridiculous room reverbs that can that can quite work quite nicely there with your transient shapers. Compressors. Actually, I'm not going to compress here. I, that compressor can be cool, but I don't always love it for when I'm working hard on things. Again, threshold right down, ratio right up, attack and release right down. Okay, so now what I'm looking for again is how do I, what do I want to do to this sound? Do I want to kind of flatten it? In which case, I'm kind of ripping the guts out of it. Or thing. Or bear in mind that makes the sound smaller. Leave that right down, very aggressive. Pretty aggressive. While it's made the sound smaller, it's also made it punchier. Let's look at the levels here. So with that, with about one, six. So it's made it louder, but it's also made it punchier. That's the more important thing. So it's not about whether one is right or wrong. Some people will automatically say, well, you've got to do this. It's like, no. What's this trying to do? You know, what's, what's the aim of this? That's made it punchier. That allows the sound to be looser. One of the problems with automatically making every single sound punchy is that your mix loses groove. I've been asked a question about groove. I'm cogitating upon that. Uh, but I can tell you right now that one of the problems with a lack of groove is an excess of compressing. So They don't sound the same anymore because we've taken travel of that snare, the looseness of that sound, because it's built to have some sense of looseness. Remember, you've got the body and the noise are separated, whereas this is kind of jamming them together again. So you're changing your groove. So whilst we've got this loose, we've got kick, and that snare is actually two sounds, the body and the noise. Hands back in short. So you've got kick and all the components of the kick. Because remember, that's made up of quite a lot of components, and they're all traveling through time. So as each of those gets heard or perceived, and then your snare in particular, we've got those two sounds. So the, the, the body and the noise. And that changes the groove because it actually pulls the groove back a little bit. So it's like, to some extent, a little like having a late drummer. Kick, late snare, kick, late snare, kick, late snare. So you can play early or 
late. That's actually groove. Without changing our timing at all, the way that our sound behaves through time actually changes the perception of groove. So before we even look at moving MIDI hits around or anything like that, if we change the length of our sound, the attack of our sound, and in this case, the fact that reasonably snappy intro, relatively snow, slow. You see, changes our groove again, changes our feel. So please don't automatically go, it's a snare, it needs this compressor put on it. What's the groove you're playing? Because if you just compress everything to, yeah, you might end up with nice tight sounds, but you could have wrecked the groove of the performance, which is one of the interesting things about where those delays were put on. Let's see if we can find them again. Is quite different, ignoring the double hits there is quite different because the echoes pull that snare back, makes it, gives it more attention over time, so you've changed your groove. So first part of your answer there, Travis, is if you're struggling with groove and you think that everything you do sounds the same, I'm going to hazard a guess that you're probably grabbing every single sound and doing a classic let's make it sound tight compression on it, which means that none of your sounds allow for groove. And you're then going to try and put it back in somewhere else. Allow your sounds to help you build your groove. So that being the case, I'm going to be a lot more flexible on my sound. See, that's allowed that sound to actually have even more hit. We're just adding a little bit of compression as it gets to the point where our, uh, the end of our overtone, which is actually becoming an undertone in this case, is starting to get loud. We're just controlling some of that, along with the noise that's getting loud at that point as well. So we're letting all the interesting stuff happen, and then we're just sort of saying, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll curtail you a little bit. Rather than continuing to go up in volume, you've made your point. You've gotten to there, and now we can taper you off just a little bit. If we got aggressive at this point, then we would be closing that sound down again. But nonetheless, we've still got a lot of our timing happening there. We just want a little bit in this case, because I want to keep the timing and the groove of this sound. So remember, each sound has a groove inside itself as well. Other common things that we would do, compress EQ. We've really largely looked at EQ, but looking at it again here, you can get into this. Bear in mind, a big fat snare sound. Our kicks included in there too. Putting the two together, you're creating a big lump. So if you're going to make a fat snare by adding a bass to it, consider not having that much bass on the kick. Not at all uncommon in rock mixes to have a really bright kick to get it right up there through the mix. And then your backbeat's really important, so you can have a really warm snare sound with a lot of on it. Just make sure that you uh, high pass that so that you're getting rid of that. That sounds great soloed, but it's going to start to interfere with your bass player. So you can warm, you warm your sound. Very tempting to do this. Add vast amounts of air. Some situations it's brilliant. But if you've got other things that need to lead the mix, like, I don't know, a singer, if you've given that snare drum a huge amount of air, which is this high EQ, that snare is going to fight the singer all the time. Your singer is not going to be impressed because you're making them second fiddle to the snare drum. And 
most of the audience are going to be wanting to hear the words more than the snare drum. Even if they don't take time to understand what the words are, they still want to hear them. So, yep, better air is nice, but you might achieve better by doing something like this. Find where that is in your mix. Find a point where you can poke it through without making it too too bright or stealing all the air from whatever is the lead in the track. It comes down to what's happening in your mix. But if you want them to really sparkle and shine, then yeah, add a lot of air up top and they're just gonna be like, ooh, especially if you are putting bit of reverb. General rule, you don't necessarily want halls on snares. They're just too big. Either a room or almost every engineer's favourite, a plate. This is where if you want that big sound, then you can look into gates. Personally, I love controlling my gates. But that's great. It's even better if you can control your gate with MIDI, so that way you can set your... you've got your kick, got your snare and then your next kick so you have your snare and its snake and its gate set to cut off just a bit before that next kick sounds brilliant so you fill the space then you get it out of the way that's what gates are about EQ we can then let's boost our, our bottom end here Get rid of our boost here. Yeah, how that comes in underneath. It's a lot more subtle. So if you want to give your snare a bit more warmth or body or oomph, you can actually add it in with your reverb. Could even warm that up. Like that. I don't like it because I don't think this reverb sticks to this snare at all. Not like this. But it's a technique that you can use. If you do both at once, you're probably wrecking it. But commonly, if you're EQing, But you can also find a particular point where you want to pick something and you're pulling certain parts of it through the mix but you're using the reverb to pull it through rather than the sound itself, especially if you use something like a, a pre-delay. Okay, so you can add another element and use your reverb to do it. So don't be afraid with snares. You can do with kicks as well, but with snares in particular, you can get quite aggressive with uh, an EQ curve and say, this is a bit I really want to pull through and add something like a um, pre-delay. I 
ideally you want to do that so that the two sands still gel together. But occasionally you can do that in ways that are quite unexpected or wrong. Uh, Prince did stuff with a backwards reverb. And so that snare hit as it, the sand reappeared backwards. It sounded like a, a slapback delay. But because it went backwards, it was really arresting until everyone decided to copy it. Again, you can use hall sounds. Small spaces can be really cool on snares. Because they are, at essence, quite small. Let's turn on that EQ. So you can jam quite a bit on. Once you get up into bigger decays, they can start to sound very boxy. So you can use the boxiness as a, or you can just simply allow the wetness. Very dry. That wetness gives the drums a real presence. That's going on both, but it gives them a presence. You don't really hear it. You don't think, oh, that's a reverby snare or drum. They still seem really tight. So your shorts are great for that kind of stuff when you don't want to splash it all over the place. Typical roomy stuff. And that's a real big splashy snare sort of thing. Again, all depends on what you're wanting to do with your mix. So reverb, you can again add your um, like shuffle your order of devices around by EQing after. Okay, we'll run through again. So what we're doing is we're making a sound. We're compressing it, which squishes it, and including squishing some of the frequencies, so it makes the sound a little bit more dead. Adding reverb allows that sound to sort of blossom, sort of unfold its petals a little bit. EQing it after the reverb, yeah, that's really sort of bright and shiny. Comes down to a personal preference as to what you want. That's focused on your mids. just super bright and shiny. No right or wrong. If we put our EQ before our compressor, not a lot of difference there, but it does change the way the compressor works because it's dealing with a different balance. So always try it. And I hope if you're not working in Reason that you've find it just as easy to drag things around from one position to another just to audition them. It may make a big difference, may not make any noticeable difference at all, but it's worth trying. You can also do this. Let's turn the, this decay up a bit more. Yeah, that allows us to still have this ridiculous amount of reverb, but it's uh, allowed us to change the balance of that reverb a little bit. You could say, yeah, but why don't you just turn the reverb down? It's not going to work the same, because what our compressor is doing here, it's allowing the full sound of the, of the kick and reverb to come through and then turning it down. Yeah, they start to sound really monolithic because it's using the compressor to do what the human ear does when things are too loud. Let's a little bit through and then go, look at this, let's turn the volume down. So, obviously, 
depends a lot on what we do with this and our balance there. So where that kind of sounds, well, natural, but it's prone to being a bit sloppy in a mix. It's allowed us to keep all that <laughs> reverb as well as emphasizing the beginning of it. So we've got the, the, the sound, the beginning of the reverb, and then we start to lower the, lower the volume. We still hear it, but it's, it's down. It says to our brains, wow, this is really loud. Plus, it's going to give you a little bit more space in a mix to do other things. So it sounds like gigantic without using the slightest bit of drive of any kind at all. Love it. Now, you don't have to have such a, a ridiculously long sound to still take advantage of that process. Just that really kind of in-your-face sort of sound. It is an 80s thing, but I don't care. I don't give a shit. It was just that these were techniques that they worked out how to do because they suddenly got all these bits of gear they could wire together. We shouldn't say, oh, that's 80s shit, not do it now, or only do it if we're trying to be retro-wave, but to acknowledge what did those techniques allow us to do. And that great big in-your-face sound is is wonderful. That's what people are looking for. So there's a technique to be able to take your sounds and make them much more in-your-face. It's changed our groove of our overall sound just by the order in which we put things and process them. I'm guessing if we took our EQ brighter again, we put our EQ after, slightly different sound again. I prefer it to four. So we've got that combination of natural and somewhat absurd at the same time, which is just going to sound great on a record to do it that way. What are the common things? Of course, we're going to look at making it sound terrible. Um, distortions and stuff, they're character effects. I'm actually going to leave that alone. Um, I'll come back to it later. Now, bear in mind, remember the problem with this device is that it adds volume and never takes it away. So it's always going to sound better the louder you turn it up. Maybe not that far. Because it's made everything louder. So we really need to turn it down. Let's turn it down here. That's quite a bit. Again, we can choose where that goes in, in our chain. Because it's got a lot of bass in there, it's much better to have that after the EQ. But we can put it just after EQ. Still sounds very overdriven. It's always going to depend that on the um, again sounds overdriven. That's going to depend on the device and how it saturates. You, you've got to know your devices and try them. You see, once we've gone after the compressor. We can go pretty hard. Let's just put that back up where it was. Oh, blam. So what we're doing there is adding a whole pile of overtones so we can keep more of the, just the low stuff, leave the highs alone, or keep the highs, leave the lows alone, or do both. Again, it, it it mimics that that kind of overdriven thing. It's huge, absurdly huge. I don't know whether I could use that in a mix. Definitely not one of mine. But that shows you how those massive sounds are done. So if you think of something like the um, 
uh, power station, Robert Palmer and a couple of guys from, from Duran Duran. Uh, go have a listen to that. I mean, they were probably about the biggest drum sounds and that would be using processes like this. I'm not trying to emulate that at all, but that's something like this is what they did to get that immense drum sound in, in those mixes, which were really very, very cool. Um, I think that's sort of the most of, of what you're likely to end up doing with these things. Um, and because I said it's real character stuff. You can put drums through. But it's, it's character. You're not going to want a whole mix. Like that. You can do it though. It's a bit noticeable on your um, on your rolls. But if you're very subtle, and I would normally avoid doing this to the kick. At least as a common rule of thumb, but that doesn't stop me in my mixes where my drums play a supporting role rather than a more sort of central role. But if you're worried about your drums seeing a little too flat, you can do that. It's another way to move them through, but of course it's quite synthetic sounding. So if you're after synthetic, by all means whack a phaser or a flanger on them. It's, it's going to bring things out. If you're doing that just on your snare and you're leaving all your other devices in that drum mix where they are, so they're all static and your snare is moving around inside it, your snare stands out every time. Doing it to the whole mix, as I say, it's something that I'll do to my mixes, but I probably wouldn't do to a, to a classic rock pop song because you're actually de-emphasizing a lot of the other instruments. But I'm happy to de-emphasize my drums. It's an important part of the mix for me, but they're not the important part of the mix. Uh, so either or, if you get into special effects like that, just be aware you can be doing some damage. I think that really covers a, a lot of ground. With snares, you can be very, very inventive and, and do all manner of, of unusual things. Um, it's the building of all the elements, but three or four elements and you'll have a very characterful sound. And then just making sure, as I said right from the beginning, that the character of your sound matches the things that it's working with. You could make the most amazing, fascinating drum sound known to mankind, but if you put it in a mix where it doesn't sit comfortably, it's going to sound awful. So if you feel like your snares sound awful, then it's because they're not tuned right or in some way not gelling with your mix. It's not a mix problem, it's a sound problem. So don't go saying, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll put more effects on it until I control it. No, get rid of all your effects. Make that sound sit right by going through its elements, which is its, its initial skin, which is your main tone. The secondary skins and bodies, which are your overtones, or as you see here, you can work them as undertones as well, but we'll call them overtones. Make sure they sit with your mix nicely. They've got to sit where they are in their mix properly, or they'll sound like busted assholes. Uh, and then things like noise. You see, playing with this, the noise component. Can change our mix tremendously like that sounds so cool because it's so horrifically bright but it could be wrecking your mix absolutely destroying your mix so look at your tuning of or your eq of sound if it has to stay that high maybe there's some other thing you can do it but it may be that and or your EQ as well. You may say, okay, that's cool, but I have just far too much top end on it, far too much air. Again, I can do that here. I can have this ridiculous amount of air.
because I don't have anything else to compete with it in a mix. But in your mix, it may be fighting. So go back, look at those components, and then the extra things that you've built up. The best way is to get rid of all the extra things that you've built up. So turn off all this stuff. It's not as important as you think it is. Get it right here in your mix, so that all the components are right. And then add your elements back in. Not necessarily in the order in which you have them. Okay, sounds cool like that. Okay, sounds cool like that. Ooh, now I'm starting to have problems. So what is it? Nah, that's that's not the problem. Oh, that was a problem. Rather than first reaching in to say, okay, I'm wedded to my sound, will death do me part and will kill this mix, and then go in and say, oh no, I need to add another equalizer. Ooh, bad frequencies. And chop them out. Because you find that you, you've now got like 78 processes when there's a fair chance you could have done that up here and stuck with four processes. Maximum output, minimum input. And that's by thinking. Grabbing another processor to, to hope that it solves your problem is very producery. You feel really about how clever you are. I just watched a video from a guy who was, he was talking about a, a, a situation he'd seen in another video. I really don't know what it was. It was all a bit third hand. But basically, very simply, there's a, it's recording of a session uh, with Dr. Dre behind a, an, an engineer, and he says to the guy, can you change the volume of that sound? And the engineer's dicking about with um, EQ and this, that, and the other. And Dre keeps saying to him, no, dude, can you just change the volume of it? And then eventually, apparently, he kind of gets the dick and goes, mate, it's not an EQ thing. Just change the volume of it. So remember, simplicity. Go back to the basics rather than going, I'm going to add 47 layers to solve my problem. All you're doing is hiding your problem. And you'll never get rid of it. Look at simplicity. Is it just that this snare is too snary? Is it just that we've got too much bottom in our snare? That could be the perfect snare for you. All snare, no body. That solves your problem far more than going in with an EQ and trying to round all that stuff off. So you've got the woof coming in from that over to undertone, which is a funny thing to do. So let's put it back where it belongs. A bit more of a straight metal snare sound. Always start at the beginning, then you can add your things, but don't add your things until you're in the mix. Very strongly. Unless it's absolutely going to change the way you compose. Even if you know in the end you want it to be this great big sound that I ended up making here, Compose with those, give yourself options. Because then when it comes to the mix, rather than being wedded, welded to this sound, which turns out to be causing you problems, you can say, I've got this, how do I want to build it up? How does the song want it built up? And you may find that you're going a completely different direction. So rather than having this big kind of Robert Palmer drum sound, you may go, that's really nice, but I think I want to mix that like a jazz kit. I want to keep that really loose. You might go in and then say to the, the, um, the snare midi line, your snare drummer, hey, Mr. Snare Drummer, I want you to play real loose. So in which case, you take all these midi notes and you tell them to humanize or juggle themselves around. You might say, hey, Mr. Uh, Mr. Snare Drummer, I want you to play so relaxed you're late. So, a 
that's overdoing it. But just between a kick, snare, kick, snare, kick, snare, kick, snare. Play really light. Find out what the song wants. Thank you very much. Next one's probably going to be on hi-hat and other metallic components. Give me a day or so. You'll need a day or so to process this. You probably need to go back and watch all the other videos over and over again. There's an awful lot in here. Thanks very much.